Hello and welcome to this lecture on confidence intervals and estimation. After this lecture, students should be able to explain the concept of estimation, point estimates, confidence level, and confidence interval. Students should also be able to calculate and interpret confidence intervals for means and proportions, as well as describe the concept of risk and how to reduce it. Estimation is the process whereby we select a random sample from a population and use this sample to generate a sample statistic that we then use to estimate a population parameter. Point estimates are when we use a sample statistic to estimate the exact value of a population parameter. And confidence intervals are a range of values defined by the confidence level within which the population parameter is estimated to fall. This confidence level is the likelihood expressed as a percentage of probability that a specified interval will contain the population parameter. The margin of error is the radius of this confidence interval. When we take a sample from the population, we're using that sample plus what we can assume about the sampling distribution to make estimates about the population. Again, the main point of taking a sample is so that we can generalize or infer something about that larger population of interest. And this estimation process using confidence levels and confidence intervals is how we do that. And you will see this a lot of times when you look at academic research articles, but also when you look at more everyday things like polling, surveys, advertisements, drug effectiveness, etc. For example, you will frequently hear something like Biden has a 44% approval rating plus or mi minus four percentage points. That plus or minus four percentage points is a margin of error. And it is representative of how confident the polar is on that estimate. That 44% is an estimate of the population parameter, which is unknown. And so in reality, Biden's approval rating, if it's 44% plus or minus 4%, really falls in a range of 40% to 48%. So let's talk about this a little more. When we estimate about a population, we know that due to the sampling distribution, that there's some margin of error. This error generally comes from the various types of sampling error, which can cause our sample statistic to deviate from our population parameter. This can include non-response error, sampling frame error, coverage error, as well as any other errors that come into our measurement tools. Confidence intervals are usually given at the 0 0.9, 0 0.95, or 0.9 levels and measure the chances out of 100 that the specified interval will contain the population parameter. So basically what we're saying is that we are 90% confidence that our sample statistic is accurately capturing our population parameter. So we're saying that, again, if we're using the example of Joe Biden's popularity, if it's 44% plus or minus 4%, and we are using a 95% confidence interval, we are saying that we are 95% confidence that Biden's actual approval rating in the population as a whole is between 40% and 48%. Again, this only works because we assume that our sampling distribution, as we get a larger sample, approaches normal. So let's talk about how we actually calculate these confidence intervals for means. First, we use the central limit theorem to assume that if we have a large enough sample, that our sampling distribution approaches normal, which means that our sample mean and standard deviation are very close to that of our population. So initially, if we have that population standard deviation and population size, we could use this initial formula where we have sigma of our standard error, that means sigma of our mean, is going to be equal to the population standard deviation over the square root of our population size. In general, however, we do not know the population standard deviation size. And as long as our sample is larger, greater than 50 or so, then our standard error can be calculated using the sample standard deviation. This is much more common as we rarely know the population standard deviation size. And so that's gonna be the uh, standard error of y is gonna be equal to the standard deviation of our sample divided by the square root of the size of our sample. Once we know the standard error for our sampling distribution, we next need to determine what the appropriate confidence level is, 
or how confident we want to be in our estimates. Once we've determined that, whether it's that 90%, 95%, or 99%, we can then use the corresponding z-score for that confidence interval. Some common z-scores for these are for 90% confidence level, we, it's 1.65. For a 95% confidence level, it's 1.96. And for a 99% confidence level, it's going to be equal to 2.58. Again, referencing back to those z-scores we calculated earlier in the semester. If you wish to use a confidence level other than the three listed, you can use Appendix B and do some calculations and look that up. But for the most part, you're not going to need to. The most common confidence levels are 90, 95, and 99 percent. Finally, we can calculate the confidence interval. Our confidence interval is generally going to be equal to our mean plus or minus that z-score for our confidence level times the standard error for the sampling distribution. So let's look at an example of this. Let's say we are interested in understanding how many hours a day people watch TV. We go out and we collect a sample of 150 people and find that, on average for our sample, people watched TV for three hours a day with a standard deviation of two. Now we want to calculate a 95% confidence interval for the number of TV hours watched per day. First off, this is our formula for our confidence interval. Because we do not have any of that population information, we're going to use the standard error for our sampling distribution, our S by bar. And so our confidence interval is going to be equal to our mean plus or minus our 95% confidence level z-score times our standard error for our sampling distribution. So let's calculate that standard error first. That standard error is going to be equal to our standard deviation, so 2 divided by the square root of our sample size, which is going to be 150 people. That's our sample size. And we end up with a standard error of 0.16 right here. So let's plug that into our original confidence interval equation here. And we end up with a confidence interval that's going to be equal to 3, which is our mean here. 3 hours a day is our mean. Plus or minus 1.96. Again, that is the z-score for our confidence interval of 95% times our standard error, which is 0.16. And we get to 3 plus or minus 0.31, or 2.69 and 3.31. And the way we interpret this is that we can say with 95% confidence that the population parameter, that population mean, falls somewhere between our 2.69, the bottom of our confidence interval, and 3.31, our top of our confidence interval, hours of TV per day. So we can say with 95% confidence that our population watches between 2.69 and 3.31 hours of TV per day. So what happens to our confidence intervals when we increase our sample size? Let's look at a previous example that we just went over, but increase our sample size to 1,500. So again, here's our initial formula. But you notice that when we calculate that standard error now, our standard error has decreased significantly. And that's because our, our sample size has increased. And so we're going to get a smaller standard error compared to previously. So previously, our standard error was 0.16. Now, it is 0.052, much smaller. And so when we plug that in, we end up with a much narrower confidence interval which means we can say with 95% confidence that the population mean, or population parameter, is between 2.9 and 3.1 hours of TV per day. This narrow confidence interval than our previous example because of our increased sample size. So what this means is as we increase our sample size, our standard deviation will decrease and our confidence window will get smaller, meaning we can make a much more precise estimate of our population parameter. So let's see what happens when we change our confidence level. So again, using our previous example, but we're going to change our confidence level to 99% instead of a 95%. So again, here's our basic formulas. We're going back to our standard error of 0.16. But notice that our z-score here has changed from 1.96 here to 2.58 here, excuse me. And what this means is that our confidence interval is going to get larger. So instead of saying that with 95% confidence that our population mean is between 
what it was earlier, 2.69 and 3.31, we now say that our confidence interval is between 2.59 and 3.41. So it's grown a higher confidence level going from that 95% to the 99% gives us a wider range for our population parameter, but reduces the risk that our estimate is wrong. And so essentially what these confidence levels are doing is if we are 99% confident about something, that means there's that 1% chance that we are wrong. If we're using 95% confidence level, then there's that 5% chance that we're wrong, so on and so forth. And really what we're saying with that is when we say 95% confidence, that means there's that 5% chance that our population parameter falls outside. It's either larger or smaller than our confidence interval. All right, let's look at calculating confidence intervals for proportions. This is very similar to calculating confidence intervals for means, but our formulas are gonna be a little different. Specifically, our formulas for standard error are gonna change. So here we have the standard error when we know some population information. So we have it equal to pi times one minus pi divided by n, and we're taking the whole square root of that where again, pi is the proportion of uh, the population. Again, not very common as many times we do not have information on the population. More often we are gonna use this formula here where we know the sample information, we have a large enough sample size. And so we get where S sub P is the estimated standard error of proportions for our sample, where P is the sample proportion and N is the sample size. And that's going to generally translate to a confidence interval where we have P is the observed sample proportion, plus or minus RZ for the corresponding confidence level, and then S sub P is the estimated standard error for our sample for the proportion. So let's do a practice calculation. We have a sample of 500 adults, and we find that 73% of them like to play video games. This translates to a proportion of 0.73. We're taking that 73% divided by 100 to get a proportion. Let's calculate this using a 90% confidence interval. So again, here's our basic formula, and we need to calculate that standard error of proportions. So that's going to look like this. We're going to start with P times 1 minus P divided by N. We're going to take the square root of that, and we're going to plug in our proportion, which is 0.73. So we get 0.73 times 1 minus 0.73 divided by 500, again, our sample size. And we end up with 0.73 times 0.27, again, divided by our sample size. And this translates to a standard error for a proportion of 0.02. So let's plug that back into our original equation. We see that we plugged in our P here for 0.73, our proportion, plus or minus the z-score for our 90% confidence level times 0 0.02, which is going to be equal to 0.73 plus or minus 0 0.033, or 0.697 and 0.763. And so what this allows us to say is that with 95, sorry, 90% confidence that our, the proportion of adults who play video games in our population falls between 0.697 and 0.763. Or if we want to use percentages, we can say that our, with 95 sorry, with 90% confidence that the percentage of adults who play video games is between 69.7% and 76.3%. Another way of thinking about confidence intervals is through risk. And this is similar to what I mentioned earlier. At a 95% confidence level, you could say that there is a 5% chance that the population parameter lies outside of our chosen interval. So that 5% chance that we are wrong in our estimate. And whether or not this is an acceptable level of risk depends on you and what you're studying. For example, in a life or death situation, studying a drug interaction or something like that, maybe you want to use a higher confidence level. Maybe you want to use that 99 or even a 99.9% .9 confidence level. For other situations, 95 or even 90% is acceptable. So it just depends on what you're doing. Anyway, that is it for this lecture. I hope it helped and I hope it made sense to you. I'll talk to you later. Bye.